White Australians talk about the outback, but no one agrees on where it really begins. For sure, though, we're right in the middle of it now, on the edge of this enormous prehistoric seabed that stretches 2,000 miles with hardly a living soul in it. Out here, even the crows fly backwards to keep the dust out of their eyes. It's a great national icon, and Australians fantasize about it, they dream about it, but they wouldn't dream of actually coming to live here. It's too weird, it's too lonely, it's too silent. This vast, primal landscape alarms us Australians. Can we ever truly feel at home here? Australia is the size of the United States, but its population is less than that of London. More than two-thirds of it is desert. Most of us choose to live not in the dead heart, as it's sometimes called, but in the cities and the suburbs that hug the coastline. And here on this thin urban belt, you will find 99% of all Australians. This is the real Aussie dream, not to live in the wide open spaces, but in the suburbs. This is the Australian dream to have the quarter acre block to build your own home and to landscape it. The Australian dream would probably have to be your own house, quarter acre block, nice quiet street in a nice quiet suburb. Mm, couple of kids, yeah. good neighbours, good great for the kids. Yeah. Probably not everyone's idea of the Aussie dream, but uh, it, it certainly is our idea of an Australian yeah. dream. But while most of us live in suburbia, we still feel nostalgia and national pride in the outback. How'd you make out? Oh, it's been one bloody beaut day. Right about midday, it must have been 100 and bloody 20 in the bloody shade. I'm quite sweaty under my armpits, I did. I'm bloody comfortable. There's me slave for me, Gus. And what do you think these two deadly night shades did all day while I'm in the rain? Strange, then, that we don't want to live there. The outback is a bit scary. I think mainly it's the total isolation of it all. The outback is, is a mysterious place. It's so wide and vast. You don't have neighbours for thousands of miles. No friends, no family close by, no schools, no shops. I'd die out there. <laughs> To find out what attracts that 1% to life in the bush, I decided to travel out back. But not without a degree of nervousness. To this day, I hardly know how to ride a horse, let alone how to saddle one. I don't know how to shear or how to handle stock or string barbed wire. And the reason's simple. Like most Australians, I am a city boy. But even a city boy knows that it was in this landscape that the legends and founding myths of modern Australia took shape in places like Malboona Station in remotest western Queensland. I can't stand being in amongst a heap of people in the city. Get over. Just get over. You want to get a bus, you want a taxi, you've got to get in the queue and wait hours. And it's, it's an interesting life. It's, you're always doing something different. You're not doing exactly the same job every day like somebody working in an office here. And I think that grows on you after a few years. Oh! 
won't have wool truck till tomorrow. Angus Dean is the owner of the station. The Dean's connection with the land has lasted five generations. I've come here at the busiest time of the year, sheep shearing. Angus runs the station with his wife, Donna. In areas as thinly populated as this, how they met is a typical tale of the outback. We went down met at Longridge and I'm still very cranky. I was the fifth girl he went out with. <laughs> well, I, in those days you didn't go out much. Roads, roads weren't all bitumen. So it was a big, a big event for me to go to Longridge to an equestrian school. So, yeah, when I got down there, I didn't, didn't let the grass grow under my feet. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't seen I hadn't seen a girl for a fair while. I took a different girl out each night and I met her on the fifth night. And took her out on the fifth, but I took her out twice. I took her on the sixth night too. <laughs> I had the Akubra hat, I had the moleskins, but the dogs on the back of the quaddy could smell a fake. Sit. <laughs> <laughs> Malbuna stretches over 120,000 acres and it has 35,000 sheep. Angus offered to show me around. Angus uses his plane to go shopping, to visit mates and to round up the woolies. Have you ever had a crash? No, oh, as a matter of fact, I have. Well, yeah. Clearly not a fatal one. No, no, but it was pretty fatal for the plane. And you didn't even have a chunder. By mid-morning, Angus and Donna have mustered enough sheep for the shearers to start their work. On the boards, the shearers race against the clock and against each other. The men are paid by the number of sheep they shear. Today, they aim to get through three to four hundred each. The sight of teams of shearers hard at work is one of the most iconic and enduring images of Australia, depicted here in the late 19th century by the painter Tom Roberts in Shearing the Rams, one of the great early paintings that told us Australians who we were. When I left Australia 35 years ago, this life on the land was part of my imagination. We all thought of ourselves as somehow connected to the bush and the bush to us. Even though others were living at forests, this rugged life in the outback was near the source of our culture, our poetry and our songs. Australians like Bill, Donna and Angus are marked by their devotion to the land. But how long their descendants will be able to stay on it may be less certain. The bush way of life is in decline. The wool market has all but collapsed. Angus sells his wool for 25% below the cost of production. The outback is afflicted with poverty and depression. Nowadays, most of the energy and vitality of Australia is to be found in the cities and not out here in the bush. And the number of Australians who actually live on the land and have a deep relationship with it is in steady decline. prices are way down and we don't know if we can keep the stock here even today. 
surviving on just minimal rainfall every year. Young Australians realise that life in the bush is going to be no joy for them. There might be not much, much, not much of a future at all. So they'd rather poke off to the cities. So yeah, there's just nothing much left for a bush kid. Australians, the outback is not just a remote experience, it's one to avoid. Sure, we dabble in weekend bush holidays, we buy a Cobra hats and Dryzerbone coats, but we feel safest here. Our cities, a vast, crowded, cosy psychic defences against the wilderness outside that's just a short trip away. two hours west of Sydney and you might never be seen again, lost in the Blue Mountains. We will return to Australia. Why have white Australians developed this uneasy relationship with the outback? The answer goes back to the start of colonization. When the convicts and settlers arrived, they found a continent where the weather was violent and unpredictable, the landscape harsh and inhospitable. Nature here seemed inverted, sparse, hostile. There were so few points of likeness to the old Europe they had known. New names had to be found to describe the strange creatures they saw. The wombat, kangaroo, koala, platypus. there was the effect of distance. It took six months at sea to reach Australia. So far from home, this land became a prison. Quite literally so, because it was here that Georgian England sent its criminal underclass. In a gale force wind, struggling to keep my breakfast down, don't chunder on the lens, mate, I went for a sail on the Lady Sarah Nelson, an exact replica of one of the ships that brought the convicts here to Port Arthur in Tasmania. In 19th century America, space held the promise of utopia. Space was what set you free. But in colonial Australia, space was the very prison itself. The convicts would sail past the black cliffs of Maingon Bay, often compared to the gates of hell, and so they must have seemed to those arriving here. The isolation of these men seems written in the very landscape. The one culturally familiar sight to greet the convicts would have been these buildings, soon to become their home. They bear the lines of English institutions. Workhouses, poorhouses, penitentiaries.
Port Arthur was built to contain the criminal elite of convictry, the hard cases who had re-offended in their exile to Australia. One thing we Australians have always been notoriously short of is worthwhile ruins. But this, in Tasmania, is our Parthenon. It is our Pystrom. It is the jail at Port Arthur. The finest ruin that we can boast. It was the most feared place in the English-speaking world. Sure, it was a cruel place to be, but its cruelty consisted much more of that dreadful bureaucratic tedium that came to characterize the great penitentiaries of England, just monotony, loss of personality, destruction of the self. The man who invented it, George Arthur, described it as a, as a mill for grinding rogues honest. And that's really what it was. It was a giant industrial factory. It was a whole town of punishment. And the most disturbing place of all was the separate prison. The worst punishment, worse than any flogging, was just the fact of living in these isolation cells 150 years ago. No sound, no conversation with your fellow man. If you went outside, you had to wear a leather mask so that you couldn't be seen. The chapel was designed with solitary cubicles so that only the convict's maker could see his wretched face. But it didn't take thick prison walls to make the convicts feel cut off from everything they'd known and loved. Just the fact of being in this distant land was enough. The main hope was that the interior of Australia, as yet undiscovered, would turn out to be a green and fertile land. Exploration became a national passion. By the 1870s, there was an unofficial race to be the first man to cross the continent. The typical Australian explorer went out, found little and died. Some made it back embittered to have found that the new land had a dead heart. In America, expeditions had revealed fertile plains, mighty rivers, wealth and resources for the taking. Not so in Australia. Two thirds of it was semi-arid desert. There were to be no cries of westward ho. Australia was, to some degree, a prison for all its new inhabitants. Settlement could only proceed along the coastal belt, and as it did, anxiety about the land surfaced almost subconsciously in countless stories about young and helpless children lost in the bush. The outback was depicted as a malevolent death force. The children represent the dashed hopes of the settlers. The lost child is an arresting figure in the history and folklore of Australia. Painted here by Frederick McCubbin in a series of pictures simply entitled Lost. Not all Australians have found this land such a hard and alien place. I travelled to meet the Gila people in the Kimberley region of northwest Australia. Around here, the Aborigines probably first landed from Asia some 50,000 years ago.
This was a special outing for our benefit, a rare chance for the Gila to visit their homelands. A cow had been slaughtered and the site prepared for camping. For though the Gila people claim this is their ancestral home, they're no longer able to live here. With the arrival of the white man, the land was declared vacant, terra nullius, no man's land, and seized for the crown. Jimmy Pike guided me to the water hole. I'll hold the barbed wire up for you. To Aborigines, land is sacred. Every valley, salt pan, water hole formed by ancestral beings in the dream time, their story of the creation. Jimmy called out to appease the great snake that protects the water hole. Gila means water hole, and for a desert people, finding water is no small thing. They weren't having a lot of success. This place wasn't going to become another Perrier or Vichy. But it did show me how much this site mattered to these people. Now the Gila want their land back, this time protected by Whitefella law. And to set forth their case, they've painted a giant canvas depicting 50,000 square miles of the great sandy desert. Woven into this big picture are the stories, the places, the ceremonies, and the songs of their country. We will return to Australia beyond the field. Hundreds of miles from anywhere, Kuba PD is home to Australia's opal mining industry. The town itself is dusty and bleak. The location for the Mad Max films, this is the closest thing Australia has to the Wild West. It even has its own Boot Hill Cemetery. Here lie miners from all over the world drawn by a dream of striking it lucky. Kuba PD translates from the Aboriginal as white fella down a hole. Opal mining is entirely an individual business. You just stake a claim and you start digging. Down this particular hole I went to meet John James. He and his father before him have struggled to find opals here for over 40 years. There must have been an awful lot of fun in opal mining for you when you began, huh? Oh, initially? Yeah. Better than sex. 
<laughs> really? How? <laughs> when you find it. When you find it. Yeah. It's, well, it's all, all your dreams starting to come true at once. It must be a tremendous rush. It is. Yeah. It is. And uh, it sends all your adrenaline running and all your fantasies happen and uh, all those little things you always wanted in life, you think, down this way. Um, this is what's going to happen. The guy who works in the office and the factory or wherever, he's paying off his home in the suburbs. He's going to get it when he's 65. And then he's going to retire. And then he's going to buy the big flash full drive in his caravan. And then he's going to become a tourist. And then he's going to come here and dream. And he's of going what, to look at you. Of what could have been. Yeah. See? What yeah. could have been. Yeah. Oh. There's this weird-looking, shiny, rose-coloured thing in here. What would that be? Well, I, well actually, yeah, I just... <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> no, 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 I just... There's a bit of a level here. Actually, oh, shit, look. What? You bastard. Oh, come on, you're no, kidding me. I'm, I'm deadly serious. Look, that's opal there. Nobody's going to believe this when they see it. I don't give a stuff, I don't. Look at that. Here it is, here it is. You did right. Ooh. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's open. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, te I tell you, man, God looks after fools. <laughs> Three years later, the art critic is found in Cuba TV, still you know, vainly hammering at the, <laughs> the face. John places amyl nitrate charges to open the scene. Under 50 feet of rock, the detonation produces a weird feeling, the unconsummated prelude to being buried alive. And when you're down your burrow, scratching at the wall, do you ever sometimes think, what the hell am I doing here, pulling out coloured stones to, you know, so that uh, women can <laughs> hang them between their breasts? Yeah, I think about that every day. I mean, it's, uh, it, look, if you want to put my life into context as a miner in that sense, yeah, it's bloody pointless. The surreal total effect of this place climaxes at the local golf course. Boom. It has no grass, not even a blade. Each player carries a small square of green astroturf on which the ball is solemnly placed for every shot. The fairways are bulldozed dirt. The greens are sand mixed with diesel oil so that the howling desert winds don't blow them away. The work of the Kuba PD mob is small stuff compared to the vast mining projects that tear into the Australian continent. The triumphalist idea that this big country is infinitely rich and infinitely exploitable developed in the last century. Boosters saw Australia as the new America. Remember that one of our long-standing mottos has been, if it moves, shoot it, if it grows, chop it down. lives will be like here in the future. Doesn't it give you an odd feeling? I mean, starting from the beginning in a new land, with everything so unknown ahead. Gives me a feeling of strength. It's the beginning of a new adventure. Once we've developed respect for the land and we treat her as she is our mother, she accepts us and we can accept her 
We eat food from her soils, we drink water from her skies. Then we get the connection with the land, which is our spiritual connection with the land. One of the big changes since I left, one that nobody could miss, is how the conservation of nature has become a key social issue in Australia. Us Australians have to realise that we don't have, we're not having the control of, over our lives at all. It's the companies out here who are pillaging the forest and raping it and burning it. Like we need an environment to stay sane, a, like a natural environment. It's about the future and like our future generations, like our children and our grandchildren. It's like, what are they going to inherit? Like. These young greenies are angry about the destruction of the Tasmanian wilderness. To date, three quarters of the virgin forest has been cut down. The cleared sites are then bombed with napalm to burn them off. Most of the trees go to make wood chips for the Japanese paper industry. Hey, like, this wood chip thing, it's totally wrong. Like, these forests, in the old days, they'd come in and they'd only take out the best trees that were there rather than level the whole lot and they'd let the rest regenerate naturally. These eco-radicals believe they must try to turn the clock back to a time before the white man had destroyed the forests and decimated the people whose land this was. Aboriginal people had an extremely close connection with the land. It was a part of their culture, a part of their religion, as I guess as white people would put it. And we've just fully written off and ignored the way they lived and ignored like the secrets that were underpinning their culture that helped connect them to the land because they certainly wouldn't go around clear felling like like we do. I, in particular, um, I am ashamed of my heritage, that we've come over here and we've totally disrespected the people and the land and it's continuing and, it, and it's really hard. So I think what we have to do is just start respecting. Sometimes the Australian eco-movement isn't just about saving the environment. It tends to get very bound up with feelings of guilt and self-recrimination. It's as though some Greens believe that the white man should never have come to Australia at all and that all he's done since he got here was wreak havoc and destruction. Today it's become fashionable, mainly among city folk, to see the Aboriginal claim to a spiritual identity with the land as the only true one, and Whitey's connection with it as inauthentic. The question of who has a claim on the land has become a hot political issue in Australia today. Land owned by white people for generations is being given back to its indigenous owners via the courts. <laughs> oh, shut up. That's right. yeah. So, Lindsay, this place, I, mean, I guess it looks like raw bush to strangers, but it must be saturated in memory for you. Well, it is, and of course, this particular site is just one of them. It's probably the most important one for our family because it's been the scene of so, so many happy family memories. It's your sacred site. It's absolutely <laughs> our sacred site. That's certainly how we think of it. But... The McDonald's have lived here for generations. Lindsay's father-in-law is buried on the farm, and their daughter married on this very site their homestead in Queensland, along with a number of others in the area, is under a native title claim. We, we feel that we have been judged guilty of something and we don't know on what basis. I think that feelings from land don't come from race. I think they come more from culture and the practice of culture. And that means that those indigenous people who have practiced their culture uh, in a continuous way, of course, have very deep feelings for land. But so do those of us who have been on the land for some generations and have a deep commitment for it. I'm not saying it's necessarily the same, 
but that commitment and attachment is definitely there. And it's valid? Of course it's valid. The claim on their homestead means that the McDonald's cannot get a loan from the bank to invest in new machinery or livestock. They can make no plans. The bush people find it very hard to forgive the hypocrisy, I have to say that. There's an enormous amount of hypocrisy because basically it is country that's being asked to bear this burden and not the city. I think all of us in the bush would say to the cities, we don't see why you shouldn't share that. Um, after all, if the land that we live on was once Aboriginal, surely the land that you live on was once Aboriginal. And uh, if there is a cost to pay, surely that should be borne by all Australians. McDonald's argument is provocative. It sets off deep controversy in modern Australia. Some resent the very idea of anyone voicing it, but a racist it is not. I share her belief that whites can be at one with this land and that they can create a spiritual home here. We will return to Australia beyond the fatal shore. Oh, William Blake, he said, nature shows its energy in minute particulars and it's in an intense scrutiny of minute particulars that you can get a sense of the whole universe. The English artist John Woolsley spends months at a time in the central deserts on a spiritual quest to connect with the land. I've often done a, a painting and I've then torn it in half and buried one half and left it for a year or in this case something like nine years. The other half I keep pristine and careful like a proper work of art might be kept and I hide it in my sketchbook. Woolsley may be a pom, but he's spent 28 years visiting these remote wildernesses, a lot more than most Australians. Goodness gracious me, it all looks much the same. It's there. It's mostly there. There's a... She's got a hole in it. The colour's almost gone. The moment when I join the two is, is always something very affecting and, and peculiar. For some reason, it's a very, very moving thing. I don't, I don't know why. I'm, in fact, I almost am hoping someone's going to tell me. John's work reminds me of the early scientific explorers in its detailed botanical observations. But his approach breaks with the way that the first whites looked at this landscape. So much of the old landscape painters were people who, even the way they painted, they had an easel and they said, now that over there is land, I am an artist. Quite often they'd say, I'm an important artist, I'm a very important person. And they would then paint their rendering of the land. And quite a lot of it was to impress people about how wonderful the land was or to sell it. I mean, a lot of the earlier paintings were to sort of say, this is good country. The early Australian landscape painters supplied an image filled with hope and prosperity, one which even looked familiar. The landscape was transformed into property, infused with the sense that Australia has at last come into the hands of its rightful owners. 
And when John Glover paints the fast vanishing Aborigine, one is made aware that whether he approves of their passing or not, he regards it, as most settlers did, as quite natural and historically inevitable. This view of the land as a spectacle of natural wonders has developed into Australia's largest industry, tourism. Yes, this is the first time that we've really taken the plunge and gone out back to the centre of the country. But to come right out here, it's a, it's a first. Julian and Lorraine are on a luxury bus tour, and today they are to visit Uluru, also called Ayers Rock. I've had an ambition all my life to, uh, to climb Ayers Rock, and uh, this is the opportunity now to have a go at it. Yeah. I think it'll be awesome and very inspiring to see such a great rock, really. Just the, uh, the symbolism, I think, and the size that we've got something unique in Australia out here and uh, a lot of people from overseas come and, and see it, but a lot of Australians uh, overlook it, really. From Darwin to Adelaide, their journey retraces the ill-fated trip of the explorers Burke and Wills, except that this air-conditioned party will stay at five-star hotels along the way. This is the goal. Ayers Rock looms up like a giant mound from 10 miles away. From the 1950s onwards, increasing numbers of white Australians visited Ayers Rock. Camp is made at the base of the sheer wall. The radio mast goes up to confound the spirits of the primitive men who made the rock for untold ages, the focal point of their legends and ceremonials. The local Aborigines, the Anangu, were displaced. They mightn't look it, but they're nearly civilised. Then to climb the rock itself, no easy task, as the sides steepen to an angle of 60 degrees, and the surface is flaky and treacherous. All my life I've thought about this. Yes, it looks very challenging today. Yeah. The big climb became the white Australian sacred duty. For the Anangu, watching tourists hike over their sacred site was deeply upsetting. When, in 1986, the rock was handed back, the Anangu decided not to forbid climbing, hoping that in time, visitors would come to respect their wishes. Oh, where'd you go? <laughs> and each year, fewer actually do go up the rock, and there are fewer heart attacks. <laughs> oh, that's good. Never again. <laughs> oh, you, you look worn out. Oh, no. so. <sighs> to some, this is and always will be Ayers Rock. To others, it's Uluru. To the Ayers Rockers, this great monument of nature stands as a symbol of white Australian identity. To those who call it Uluru, it represents an important victory in the long and tortuous process of reconciliation, of saying sorry and handing the land back to the Aborigines. But now it's hard simply to enjoy the rock, bound up as it is with these cultural and political definitions. It's lost to our gaze, reduced to a token, a spectacle for consumption, a cipher. It's very interesting. I've, I've been watching tourists. Quite often I'm painting near some beauty spot like um, Uluru. The number of people who get out of the bus, the first thing they do is not look, oh, 
what is this, w w where am I, it's they take the photographs first. They're actually trying to create their virtual world even before they've actually experienced it. I, I think the extent to which we are alienated from the physical structure of what surrounds us is much more radical th th than we think. At 5.30, the high point of the entire trip. Sunset at Uluru, without which no visit would be complete. Can't see them, they might be down. Ah, and yes, there's, there four, is. there's four up there now. Yes, oh. there is. Can't four. you see the white? Someone's yeah. got something white on. Six thirty and the Uluru traffic jam. Thousands of trippers leave the site to start their journey home to the safety of the cities. Sydney, the bush survives. As the sun sets, the skies begin to fill with the flapping pterodactyl-like shadows of a time long before the white man came. Giant fruit bats leave their roosts for their nightly forage through the suburbs. Winged emissaries of nature in all her strangeness, reminding us whether we like it or not, that the bush is never far away.